Do, 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 do. Welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. This is the Backyard Professor Chess videos. Duh. <laughs> hey, uh, this next game I have is by one of my very favorite chess players. I get it out of this one, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. This is uh, David Bronstein's uh, collected games with Tom Fürstenberg. Very excellent collection. There's hundreds of games. Uh, the date on this is... Uh, where is the date on this? I should have done this beforehand to show my vast amount of preparation and fecundity. However, I'm just a doughhead. Uh, 1995. So it's, it's uh, a great, great collection of games. This particular game was the... Uh, Two giants of chess, David Bronstein and Viktor Korchnoi, two of my very favorite chess players. Korchnoi plays the Grunfeld defense in this one. This was at the 20 Years Liberation Tournament in Belgrade, 1964, so I was three years old. I remember this well. I watched it on television. No, I didn't really. I don't think they televised it here in the USA. Bronstein came within one game of the world championship against Mikhail Botvinnik. That's how good he was. He was the second strongest player in the world. Easy to say he's in the top 20. <laughs> top 10, probably. He was fabulous. Let me show you this game. This was, this was voted as the best chess game of the tournament. And so, and like I say, uh, I will uh, go through many of our games in our Backyard Professor Chess Tournament. I want to pick the best game of the tournament. Uh, realistically, it'll, it'll be the one where I lost. <laughs> no, I'm not going to pick my own. Mine have no clout whatsoever, but there were some great chess games. I'm looking forward to examining those when I get the chance to. For now, I've got to keep you guys happy with my chess videos, so I want to kick out several videos and keep you guys hopping uh, in your understanding. We're always seeking to improve, and we're always seeking to get better. And we're always seeking to improve, and we're always seeking to get better. Didn't I say that once? Yeah. That means twice. That means that's a serious emphasis. Yes. So anyway, enough clowning around, although you know me by now. I have to clown around because I enjoy this game. And you must have fun in chess. Otherwise, throw your board out. Unless it's a collector item, mail it to me, Backyard Professor. I'll be glad to hang on to it for you. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, now, Korchnoi does knight, takes d5. So we are seeing a strong battle for the center. The knights are opposing each other. Does Bronstein worry about that? No, he does not. He proceeds to push to the center with his pawns. He wants to occupy the center with his pawns, apparently, which is not a bad thing to do. Korchnoi goes ahead and swaps the knights. Yes. And then, so... Bronstein, in this particular Grunfeld defense against Korchnoi, has an exquisitely powerful pawn center. And when you're Bronstein, none of us are, so we don't have to worry about this, having a strong center is a good thing to have against Victor Korchnoi, who came very, very close to the World Championship. These are two giants. They're titans boxing it out. This is a superb game. Bishop g7, of course, he will be in Keto. We'll see if that does him any good. Of course, then it is Korchnoi, so it probably did do him a lot of good. We'll see. c5. Uh, there's no reason to allow your opponent to have an unopposed center, and there is every reason to fight him for it. So c5 truly makes sense. I promise it does. 
uh, 92. Bringing out the Knights, Korchnoi, Will Castle. He castles and Bronstein will castle. They both castle early because they know the fight power of each other is immense. And so they don't take anything for granted. Knight c6. Here comes again arguing for the center, which is proper to do. And now Korchnoi is going to begin an excursion. Very interesting how he does this. Watch this. Now Bronstein will drop the bishop back and Korchnoi proceeds to strengthen his queen side and Bronstein says, okay, you want to play queen side. I have a secure center. Now Korchnoi is not being mowed over in the center. So there's nothing really coming marching through the center. It is an occupied center, so he feels justified in going to the wing. Bronstein is willing to meet him on the wing. You've heard me say in previous videos that uh, you need to have a secure center before you do any wing play. So you might be questioning Korchnoi, saying, what the heck, dude? You don't have a strong center, but there's nothing being attacked in the center either. These are two of the best, so it's okay for Korchnoi. Now, look, you know, here I am blabbing on and on about the center now. Korchnoi is not going to let that center unchallenged. That's just how it is, right? So, so this is great chess. Bringing the rook in, he's going to continue developing. He's going to bump the queen down to a3 which is kind of interesting. We'll see what that does here in a little bit. C takes D4. Korchnoi opens up the diagonal. Now, of course, he's not going to take the rook with this queen yet, but the influence of the queen becomes real interesting. Because he knew Korchnoi was going, he knew eventually he was going to open up. This diagonal was not safe, of course, so he comes here to this diagonal, he's got the across, and he's got the straight up, which isn't that big a deal, but the, the fun is how the queen from afar eyes the center and that castle kingside. I'm, I'm just pointing out the obvious because it makes me sound so smart. <laughs> I'm not real smart, but man, do I sound it right? I mean, just record me and see whatever... Just stop. Just stop. Stop. And now, of course, E will take D4. Now, here we get uh, quite a series of exchanges to, uh, to get into the middle game past the opening. Which one of these guys does survive and which one loses the opening? That's what we want to know. The knight will take the bishop. And we are firmly in the middle game at this point. Bishop g4. Who lost the opening? Neither one of them. They are definitely in the middle game. Who's better situated in the middle game? My personal bet is on Bronstein. Simply because, and I know it's my bias. It will always be my bias. I can't foresee it changing ever so far as I'm aware is because his pieces are better coordinated. Okay, you thought I was going to say it's because he dominates the center, didn't you? That's a piece of it. But it is through uh, the domination of the center that gives you the better coordinated pieces, and therefore I think Bronstein stands better here. I know, it's a bunch of vague generalities, but like I said, it makes me sound smart, so just let me have my moment, will you? <laughs> no, no, truly, uh, I think the coordination is definitely on Bronstein's side here. I'm not trying to be biased, I'm just saying. And the bishop will swap the bishop. Bishop takes e2. Knight will take e2. So see, it's not a matter of dominating the center so much as just making sure that your position is stronger because you have a better 
coordination and actually a better coverage of the critical parts of the board, right? Wonderful influence this way through the center and now he's got the open file. That's a good setup. So that that's one of the that's one of the reasons why I'm saying Bronstein at this point just sincerely seems better for the moment. But he's playing Korchnoi. And you can't even blink when you're playing Korchnoi or you lose. I, I mean, and, and I will get to these through time. Uh, what's his nose? That's disrespectful. I don't mean any disrespect, Mr. Kasparov. Gary Kasparov, in his book, My Great Predecessors, has an absolutely magnificent section of dozens of Victor Korchnoi's games. They are pure gold. Wonderful to play through. I haven't played through them yet. Not all of them, but I. there's only so much time in the day, you know. But... This is Korchnoi, so you cannot go to sleep. Queen to e8, uh, and now knight c3. So, now his queen, and yeah, she's over here, true, on the edge. Uh, the knight is on the edge, uh, but her influence is really nice. She's not stuck behind pawns or other pieces that are pinned or anything. Uh, and he does have the open file, so why not activate another piece and get another piece into this game? This is what we'll see Bronstein do. Not a bad strategy. Yes, he gets both pieces. I'm just saying I'm emphasizing this, the knight for the moment because that's the one he wants to get going. Korchnoi is going to play cautiously because he is playing David Bronstein. Knight d5, great central outpost. I mean, come on, that's about as good as you can get for this particular setup. And then, of course, not an open file, but again, yes, the castle helps develop the, uh, the rook, tuck the king away, but bring that rook further into the game, rather than pushing the f-pawn at this point you are better off bringing the rook onto the e-file. Again, straight across from the queen. You say, that's not a big deal. There's a pawn in between them. That is a huge deal! Don't ever underestimate that tactic. That was pretty good, right? Full of drama. Yeah, baby! No, truly, in all seriousness, as a general strategy, if you're trying to figure out, well, what do I do next? What do I do next? Put your rooks across from either the queen or the king, and don't worry about how many pieces are in between them. That's always a good move. Yeah. So, Bronstein's full army is in this, and Korchnoi has an undeveloped rook. Korchnoi has a very uncoordinated, lousy-looking knight compared to Bronstein's central knight. See, notice, just simply looking at the board, we begin to observe the imbalances. Jeremy Silman's ideas on imbalances come around. And it helps us evaluate ourselves as well as our opponents when we're playing this magnificent game of chess. So do this as you can. The knight is obviously better. Now, the queen has potential trouble. This queen doesn't. This queen has terrific influence. So, I mean, truly, the queen's, Bronstein's is better. The knight's, Bronstein's is better. The rook's, without question, Bronstein's are better. See how that works? And there's no calculation involved. You just kind of get used to looking over the board at both yourself and your opponent and see, okay, how can I improve my position? Put your rook into the game. Put your knight up on an outpost. Nab an open file. Let your queen be influential in a coordinated way 
with the knights and the rooks. That you can see what I mean. It's it's more it's more compact and better coordinated than the knight can't combine at all with what the rook is doing. Neither of the rooks are connected. The queen is over here, honestly uh, eyeing a pawn, maybe. But so Bronstein's playing the tough game. Yeah. Well. And again, because of this, he influences Korchenoi's move. That, it, with this setup, Korchenoi's queen is just not well placed there, right? I'm, I'm just saying. So, and now, Bronstein decides, you know, um, I can put some pressure on the king side because Korchnoi has been moving his pawn cover forward. Yeah. So let's try to get pressure against Korchnoi here. And now, yeah, you got to get your knight in this game, man. <laughs> really sincerely. And now look. Ooh. Is this going to be an H-pawn thrust kingside attack? He's got all the makings for it, doesn't he? Very interesting. Kingside attacking against Victor Korchnoi? That's pretty gutsy, man. But this is David Bronstein, so I'm just saying. And now Rook C1, challenge the knight. It's sitting out there in the middle of La La Land. And now Korchnoi brings him up to B4. And Bronstein includes his knight into this attack in a most interesting way. Rook c8 will challenge the knight, of course. Now, h5. So we are seeing a kingside attack. Notice, uh, I mean, I can't read Korchnoi or Bronstein's minds, right? Look at the psychology here. And you go, huh? This is a chess game. Yeah. Look at the psychology. This is remarkable. Sincerely. Take the other open file. Challenge his rook. And his rook is still misplaced. His knight is nowhere to be found. And, and the reason why that's important is because look where Bronstein put his queen. Really? Where is she pointing? Is it any wonder Bronstein is now? And, and you have to pay attention to this because if your opponent was doing this, you'd have to go, man, oops, my knight is just... It, over there. The attack is over here, man. He's going to open up that king side. J just the psychology here is Bronstein, only, or I mean, uh, Korchnoi only has two pieces defending the king, and his pawn structure has now truly been obliterated. No matter what Korchnoi does now, his pawn cover is going to disappear. You can't save that king through the pawn cover. So, well, I mean, that means get your pieces over there. Korchnoi can't, but Bronstein can. He's much closer to this king attack. Much closer than Korchnoi is defending. You see that? So the psychology here is Korchnoi is breaking a sweat right now. Yeah, he's freaking out. He's saying, oh, and, and when you can get your opponent to do that, you can have them make, you, it, they make mistakes. Even as great as these guys are, they make mistakes. Well, I mean, there's nothing. You may as well make it count for what it's worth. But that really doesn't help him. Here comes another rook, centralized. Remember, rooks can go that way too. Yeah, yeah, I gave you the hint. Here we go. B5, okay, well, yeah, you gotta at least, at least try to keep 
attacking, trying to find targets so that Bronstein cannot further coordinate an attack against your king. My suspicion is that's what Korsnoy was trying to do. Um, and Bronstein is so powerful now that he can ignore the bluff. Notice how threat he, Bronstein found the best target, the queen, plus he got his knight closer to the king's side. Uh, Korsnoy is in trouble. Isn't that interesting how that works? That, that's really quite fun. So you got to come to e8, and now he, he yet further ignores this, and he goes ahead with the king's side attack because you have the knight and you have the queen. There's enough coordination power here. Open up the king because now you've got the, uh, the initiative. There's no question who has the initiative. And you must reply. You can't just let him get away with that. So that's two moves now that Bronstein simply ignored the attack. Now that's an attack on the rook. You know, yeah, I would freak out and all, but this is a great lesson to show you how when you have the better position, you can gain the initiative as you improve your position even further and cause his position to deteriorate and you do not have to be sidetracked by weeny little attacks that truly mean nothing. That move did not do anything for Korchnoi and the next two moves that Bronstein made did improve his position. It got his knight closer to the king side, and it disrupted the... Now there's an open file here. Queen's got targets, target squares to check the king so that Bronstein can maintain the initiative. That's really... That's nice to see, just so we understand how this is working out. <gasps> wow, it's a good thing I didn't write a commentary on this game. You'd never finish the stupid game. The moron would be typing so many words. That, yeah, okay, okay, back to the game. Okay. <clears throat> and sure enough, queen h4 check. You see how... <laughs> this, look, this is the third move now, right? That he just... That means nothing. Don't cave in to your opponent's threats when you systematically have better threats and improving your position and keeping your opponent back on his heels. What a great lesson, yeah? That's worth the video right there is to see this means nothing. No, who cares? On the other hand, Bronstein has steadily maintained the momentum, the initiative, I should say. And, of course, he's gaining momentum. He is also improving his position. And now, look how he turns this. Look how he puts uh, uh, Korchnoi on his head. Watch what he does. This is really interesting. Queen g4. How many moves is that, you guys? Four, now that he's virtually ignored this little noise over here. And look at his position. Let him take the rook. It's not going to matter. Because you've really got a wicked attack here now. Korchnoi is in trouble, and he knows it. And look at his reaction. He still can't try to wrestle the initiative from Bronstein. Because once Bronstein got the initiative, he has never let it go. Bronstein's threats are much stronger because this threat uh, is not against the king, is it? So, the king's over here. All of Bronstein's threats have been against queen, <coughs> excuse me, and king. That's really cool to see. Really. That, that, that's great chess. This is incredible. 
he still doesn't give a flip about the threat. Th that's a great lesson. No joke. I mean, this is a rook, man. That is not a pawn or a knight it or a bishop. It's a rook. And he's completely ignoring it and steadily improving his position against Korchmoy. This is fantastic. And Korchnoi still can't get his bid for the initiative going. He is on defense, man. He's been on defense for half this game. That's cool to see, right? And he still keeps going. He doesn't give a flying flip about the rook. He's putting himself into a winning position. Really interesting, isn't it? F takes e5. Threatening the queen. And queen takes g5, check. Playing as if this doesn't even exist. And I, I'm the one making a big whoop to do about this. Because, you know, we beginners, uh, we, we're taught, for one thing, we have to hang on to material. Because, look, if you get two pieces down, or one piece down, or whatever, material, uh, you'll lose the game. In the upper echelons of chess, position is much more vital. We can see that now, can't we? Yeah. The initiative is much, much, much more important than worrying about a piece. That's a great, this is a fabulous illustration of that. Really sensational. So king comes back over to h8. Queen again. Notice he has obliterated the pawn cover, which is what Korchnoi was fearing. And Bronstein has accomplished. Check. Maintaining the initiative while improving his position. Now he has no pawns to hide behind. Check. Yeah. So king h8 again. Queen h5. Check. Rook h7. Queen e5. Check. King g8. Queen g5. Check. King h8. Queen f Six, check, and here is where Korchnoi resigned. The improvement of the position. Fantastic. I think what I got most out of this game, without question, is the importance of the initiative, for one thing, but Bronstein did not play reactionary chess to what Korchnoi wanted him to do, Bronstein had his own game plan. Once he set it in motion to attack the king's side by bringing his queen over here to g3, I mean, you can't say it plainer than that. You can move your queen over here, and it's against tournament rules, but you can simply lift your head and say, I'm coming after your king now, you're being attacked. And he chose the perfect time to do that, to begin. That gave him the initiative, didn't it? And he chose the perfect timing because two items. One, an opponent had already, uh, already, Korchnoi was not as coordinated, so his defense could not be as strong nor as fast as he needed it to be, and he had a piece out here that was less coordinated. He couldn't get that piece into the game. So his threats to try to distract Bronstein were completely worthless. You don't even have to... Isn't that amazing? Because of the superior position and coordination of the pieces, he didn't even have to worry about a piece. And I mean a major piece, a rook. Look, that's big stuff, man. Who cares? Let him take it. 
by taking that rook, he would have lost more time. So, so that is a fabulous, fabulous game. And a lot of Bronstein's and Korchnoi's games are like this. In this instance, Bronstein got the best of Korchnoi. So anyway, there is your chess game. I uh, hope you had a good uh, Labor Day yesterday. In the meantime, remember, oh, hey, hang on, I've got something else I want to show you guys. I want to show you another piece of my art. Hold on, I'll be right back. Oh, my gosh. Can you see that yin-yang with the dragon's heads? Isn't that a spectacular drawing? I love that, man. That is so cool. So what I chose to do is I chose to rapose this particular art piece. Rapose is a French word meaning to push out. What you do is you trace, using rapose tools, metal tools, you trace this piece of art onto a sheet of copper and then you push out the dragons. Here's a small version. I'm going to try like crazy. I don't know if that helps or not. There's a small version. You, you have to trace it and then you punch it out on the back side. These are grooves that I hit with the tools and it pushed out those lines on this side right so you can see the one dragon head coming up and around here and then the other dragon head coming around here well this is a pretty small piece and it's got an enormous amount of errors in it it's my very first uh rapose piece so what i'm doing is i'm going to take this big piece see see the size of that much bigger i did this too small but this is a big one right so what I'm going to do is, hang on and I'll show you. Let's see if I can do this in a graceful manner. Whatever. Yeah, graceful as a three-legged duck out of water. Holy cowabunga, Batman. Anyway, there's my sheet of copper. And you can see the line that I've drawn here. I'm going to... I'm gonna, what you do is you glue this down to the copper and then I take a razor knife and I will scratch this pattern into the copper. Then I will use my rapose tools and what you do, oh, this is my big pan of pitch. I will cut that piece of copper out and I will fold the corners over. I will heat this pitch up and I will put the copper into this pitch and then I will rapose on the copper with the pitch as a base because it allows oh, man that's heavy it allows the grooves to push down and then you flip the piece over see here we go it allows you to push the piece the lines out then you turn it over and you you tap on the outside of the lines and refine them and make them look even better. So that's what Rapose is. And what I'm proposing to do, now that you, you... Oh, yeah, there's my ugly mug again. Dang, I'm handsome, aren't I? Yeah, whatever. Ooh, I've got a halo on me, man. Woo. Don't mess with me, man. I'm bad. Oh, my. Blinded by the light. I should have been a rocker. Anyway, what I'm going to do... I'm going to start this new Rapose project, and at the beginning of my videos, or at the end, probably at the end, I will show you how I'm doing this, and I'll show you different steps, and I'm not going to show you the whole thing from beginning to end. There's hundreds of hours involved, but I will show you my progress as I do this second piece, and I will talk about it and show you some stuff and all that jazz, so, so that you can see how Rapose is done. It's a beautiful, beautiful artwork. Uh, art form, I should say. So anyway, be good to well have fun.
find something creative to get your creative outlets out. Uh, chess, for instance, that's one reason why I love chess, but I like rap will say metal art, I'm doing some welding and all that jazz. So anyway, remember you're awesome. Don't argue with me, I'm not in the mood, especially when I'm complimenting you. Backyard professor just happens to be right. You are awesome. Don't forget it. And be happy. And I will see you guys in the next Backyard Professor Chess videos. Whoa. <laughs> Whatever. I hate it when I'm in a good mood because I act like such a dork. It's great, ain't it? I mean, why not? You see, normal and normal people are weird, so why not be weird and be above it? Yeah, baby. That's good philosophy right there.